just um, just maybe for context, how many of you were at the earlier presentation that Eric Frank did, where he drilled in a lot of the history of Black World? Okay, so maybe a third of you. Um, We'll talk just a little bit about what Flat World is, but then we'll kind of dive into some financial sustainability issues that David and I have been working on um, over the past couple years. And I should just state up front that a lot of what we'll see is um, relatively old data, considering that Flat World's history has been three years. We'll be looking at years one and two of their financial history. So there's 33% of its current life that hasn't been studied yet. Um, but let's just kind of dive in. For those of you who don't know, Flat World Knowledge is a for-profit company. It's received some significant venture capital funds. And their basic business model is that they will give away their textbooks for free. You can go to the, their website and read them online. But they also have a variety of other formats that you could purchase. So if you want to buy a paper copy, you can do that. Or if you want, there's an MP3. If you want to listen, you can do that. If you want just a little part, maybe you only want one chapter, you can do that. So they have lots of different auxiliaries. So the first um, study that we did was in 2009, and at this point in time, Flatworld was doing some beta testing. So they only, and this is going to be the winter of 2009, they had six texts, and they were used in 27 classrooms, about 750 students participated. And kind of the, the, the radical idea here is we're putting our textbook online for free, it's licensed openly so that professors can make whatever modifications they want to it. But if there's a free textbook available, can you make money? And one of the interesting questions I think that came up in the, in the earlier presentation is, is it even right? Is it even in the sphere of openness for a company to be trying to make money? And I think one of the, one of the neat things about Cloud is because they're trying to make money, they have some initiative to go out and get people to actually um, use their textbook. Because if there's no money involved and we create a nice textbook, someone's got to be beating down the door of the professor saying, please use this textbook. And they've got an incentive to do that, whereas maybe in other places there's not that same incentive. But if everyone uses the free textbook, there's probably no money in it, and Flat World is not going to last. So this is kind of the whole question. Is Flat World's model sustainable? So in the beta version of the 750 students, 59% placed in order with flat world knowledge. Not all of those were for textbooks because kind of as we mentioned, there are lots of different ancillaries that you can buy. The average student spent $28.20. Um, so a total of 294 textbooks were purchased. So about 40% of the students bought a textbook. And depending on what your paradigm is on electronic textbooks, that could be a surprisingly low or a surprisingly high number. To me, I think it's interesting that when there's a free version available, still you have 40% of people this time who wanted to buy the textbook and anyway, they value having that printed material. And then these are some of the ancillary products. You can see that uh, flashcards, digital flashcards, were the most popular item. And these are only including those that students bought outside of a bundle. At the time, Flat World had a product you could buy where you could get the textbook plus bundled with lots of other resources. So a lot of students bought that kind of all-you-can-eat package. But several people, as you can see, went out and bought these other products. So this was uh, the beta test, but and, and now what we want to really focus on is what happened in the 2009-2010 academic year. So as you can see, their growth was enormous. So instead of uh, a couple hundred students, they now had about 58,000 students during this academic year. And kind of the question that we wanted to pursue was, did the trends in the beta test hold, and are the, is that enough students to buying product to support the company? So some of these numbers are you know, kind of tedious, but if you don't mind, we'll just review them just to all be on the same page. So going back here, we've got about 58,000 students and a total of 16,461 print textbooks were purchased for close to half a million dollars in revenue. By the way, I think special kudos is deserved to flat world knowledge for being very open and transparent with some of this information. 
And one of the interesting findings was how many of the print copies were purchased through a campus bookstore. Originally, during the beta period, you had to go to the Flat World website to order the book. But once they rolled out, you could just go and, from the student's perspective, there's nothing special about this textbook. It's not, there's, they may not even be aware that it's an open textbook. They go to the bookstore, get their list of assigned books, got it, wow, this is kind of cheap, and I'm out of here. Um, so in total, and this is one of maybe one of the key numbers, this is lower than the beta period, 29% of students enrolled in a course purchased a print copy of the textbook. Again, 100% of the students had access online to the textbook. Now, here's another uh, little kind of interesting table, and these are the other ancillary products that they sold, because, for example, if you don't want to buy the book, but you want to print out a chapter. Maybe chapter seven is really tough, and so you think, I need this chapter, and I need it on the go. I'm not going to be able to be online, I'm going to be on the train or whatever when I'm studying this chapter. So you can just print out a chapter here, and you can see they, they sold 40,690 of those, and here's the revenue figures. It's kind of interesting to see which ones are the most popular, which ones are the least. So at, at least at this point in time, the EPUB book, represented a very low revenue stream. Although it's projected that at time, that may change as students become more and more uh, maybe uh, highly using tablet devices. So maybe a key takeaway is here. So Flat World, if you look at their business model, part of it is they're selling the textbook, and part of it is they're selling ancillary products. And these digital products made about, about one-fifth of Flat World's income in the 2009-2010 academic year. So before, um, before we kind of <coughs> shift over to the cost side, because all the revenue is great, but what did it cost to put this all together? Let's just kind of summarize. So of all of the students who were taking a class that used Flat World materials, you had about two-thirds register on the website. And one out of four of those two-thirds, or in other words, 16% of total students, made a purchase through the Flat World site. Now, again, most of the students who are buying a print textbook are just buying it at the campus bookstore. But you still have a substantial number of students who are buying these other products through the Flat World site. Average buyer makes 1.3 purchases, and the average purchase price is about $31. And some of these purchases, they could buy a collection of resources, which is why you have the large skew between number of purchases and uh, the amount of total units purchased we do buy and bundle together. Dave, did you have anything that you want to add in on the revenue side so far? Okay. So revenue is great. And we all love it, but it's also expensive to run a business. So what is this costing? Let's look first at how much does it cost to publish a textbook? Um, in, Hopefully you've noticed here several of their textbooks <clears throat> running a lot. $150,000 for the first 10 textbooks was the average cost. Since then, I think they've learned some things and implemented the last figure I heard here, correct me if I'm wrong, is about $120,000 per book. Um, and so let's, let's take a look at now these $120,000. How, how does that spread out? And there's uh, six or seven kind of key things here. So, we're paying someone upfront money to write the textbook, and that's separate from royalties that they'll receive uh, on sales. Then we pay people to review the book, make sure have we written uh, a good textbook. Design, illustrations, art, um, production, creating the different, these different uh, digital versions, audio, EPA version, instructor ancillaries, and then student ancillaries. My, and my understanding is that this is kind of the traditional textbook model. This is what a textbook publisher would be doing. They're going to peer review their book. They're going to pay someone to write it. So it costs between 120 or at least in this case $150,000 to get a textbook up and running. But now the challenge is how do we get this textbook into your classroom? So for those of you in the room who are um, creators of OER out of the goodness of your heart. And so to you, 
And this, this is kind of, I think, maybe where I fall into with my creation of OER. Like, I create this OER as a gift to the world, and I'm so excited for someone to use it. And my hope is that I put it out there, and thousands, if not tens and hundreds of thousands of people will review it and enjoy it, and humanity will be blessed. But the discouraging part is, you know, I build this great house, and no one comes. And again, this is where Flat World has kind of an interesting dynamic that I think there's, there's important lessons that can be learned. Because they're in it for profit, they have an additional motive to get more people using their textbook. So how do they do this? Well, there's lots of things that go into getting a faculty member to adopt their textbook. And for the time period that we studied, 2009 to 2010, they reported that the average cost of the faculty acquisition was about $900. And the gross profit per class who adopts a book was above $300. So in other words, they have to get a professor to use their textbook for three semesters in a row in order to make up the money of just getting the professor to say, okay, we'll use your textbook. And for me, this was a pretty astounding number. And because you think people will be beating down their door to say, wow, free textbook for my students, I'm so happy. Not the case. And this should be a really sobering number for those who are um, just hoping to freely share information. You realize, well, this is really tough to get information into the hands of people who will use it. Now, I think they've made a few kind of tweaks and changes in how they're getting faculty referrals and trying to do less um, on their side because as word of mouth spreads it makes it easier. I think the projection is for this next year will only take one semester of, of, of a faculty acquisition to pay them back. So let's kind of take a look at the bottom line. Textbooks at current enrollment equal um, I, you can see what I've done is I've taken the numbers and just, just to keep it simple, we're just going to have one textbook. So let's say instead of all the textbooks that they just have one, the current numbers, when I say current, I'm referring to the 2009-2010 school year. They made $61,000 off the one textbook, or $48,000 of that came from the book, and then $13,000 came from these other products. So yeah, let me help it here. So when you say forty-eight thousand from the book, you mean from sales of printed versions of the book? Correct. Whereas ancillaries could be digital versions of the book too, like the audio book or the e-book or something. Exactly. Or flashcards to help you prepare for quizzes and tests. So so that's good. And and remember that this one textbook cost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to do. So. It, at least in theory, and in this little equation, we've taken out the heavy costs of getting a faculty member to adopt the book. We're in a little bit of trouble because it's going to take two and a half years to pay off the costs of getting the book written. But this doesn't cover all of the other overhead and other costs that Flatwell Knowledge would face. So if this were the end of the story, we would conclude that maybe this is not a sustainable business model. But here's the other piece of the equation. In the beta version, we had 900 people enrolled. And then in the next year, the folks of our study, we were up to 58,000. That's a pretty good growth curve. And then my understanding is, as of right now, we have about 270,000 enrolled students. So that's uh, obviously a very steep and continuing curve. And in this study, 30% of students bought textbooks. So my understanding is that the current number has increased so what? All of this is to say that it's very possible that this is a financial, financially sustainable model. And so the question then is, well, who cares? Why, why does this matter? Because I think where there's something that's financially sustainable, there'll be increased growth and competition. If there's no sustainability, it makes it much harder for the process to continue. Anything else you want to chip in here, David? No, I, I, although I think, is Eric in the back of the room somewhere? Yes. I mean, so it's kind of fun, you know, to give this talk and have Eric in the room. I mean, you, you know the current numbers obviously better than we do because we only look at them, you know, year over year at the end. Do, do you want to chip in anything well, yeah, here? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as a, as, a, as a baseline, we were actually pretty happy with, um, with what you presented and were able to analyze at that moment in time. But clearly, we were on a fat 
at some point to run out of venture capital and not be profitable. Um, and so, you know, but as a foundation, it gave us a place to start to say, all right, where are the places in the formula we have to tweak? So we've gotten that cost of customer acquisition down from $900 to about uh, $500, and we think it'll be about $350 in the next selling season. So that's going to get us to that one semester payback on the cost of sales and marketing. Um, and we've gotten those conversions up from 30% total to just about 50% total. Um, and we've gotten those conversions. Real quick, my conversion is students uh, buying student finance, finance right? becoming, instead of a free reader, they become a paid reader yeah. of something. Um, and more of those conversions are on digital products versus print products, which have a much better gross margin. So more of the dollars we're making are, are, are actually profit versus uh, going towards cost of making print books. Um, and, and of course, we're growing the user base. So when we look at all that today, if we look at our financial statement versus a year ago today, uh, we're now on a path to prof profitability uh, by fall 2013, as opposed to running out of money. Uh, and so in theory, we should never need to raise any more venture capital unless we so choose to do so based on some growth opportunities. Um, and that's a very different place to be and a good place to be. So we'll see. That's still some speculative numbers in there, but all the trends are going the right direction. Yeah, great. Thank you. Can, can I just go back a little to the $900 figure of the cost to the factory to adopt the textbook? I don't understand what that cost represents. <coughs> is that your marketing cost? Or is that somehow the cost for the school? What, what is that $900? So I'll give an answer, but feel free to chime in. So part of that are indirect costs. So sending out flyers, brochures. Your costs. Yeah, this is yeah. Flat World. I don't work for Flat World. But, uh, oh, David okay. and I, that's fine. Flat World's cost. Yeah. Um, it would be Flat World's cost. Maybe they're going to send someone out a sales rep to go make a face-to-face -face call. So there's going to be airfare involved, hotels, all those sales costs. Yeah, those are basically, you can think of them as uh, program costs with sales and marketing. Um, but they don't involve people. So all the people, the sales and marketing people, are a cost that are different lines. So the pure cost of acquisition is the cost of le getting data, in leasing data to email faculty, running email marketing campaigns, running PR campaigns, running direct mail campaigns, sending out free review copies for an inspection, uh, uh, for review, etc. So it's all the program costs of sales and marketing. Do you see that cost diminishing at all also? It's, it's coming down quite a bit, and it's coming down based on, A, us learning what works and what doesn't work, and stopping the things that don't work and doing more of the things that do. So just as we learn, we get much more efficient. Um, but it also, we, we've seen a, a, the greatest trend line in our business that, that, that I think is uh, critical is the first semester, uh, when we ask the adopters, how did you first learn about flat world? 12% said from a peer. The second semester was 27%, and this past one we just went through, it was just over 40%. So that that is the single biggest driver down of the cost of acquiring a customer. And it's going to be exponential, right? As the base grows, the word of mouth grows, and the more marketing costs come down. Thank you. Please. The 270,000 enrolled students you have with Flatwork Knowledge, are they all US-based students? That's a good question, and I think this is a cumulative figure. This means, like, in total throughout the three years of flat world history, there have been 270,000. Because you know, students. you know that there are some countries that are making a national push to digital textbooks. India just came out with a $35 tablet for their students. Now they're not making a national push like <coughs> South Korea to go totally digital, but. <coughs> Have you, has Flat World Knowledge thought about hitting up <coughs> countries with large populations where the, lang the hot language used in higher education is English? Singapore, Hong Kong, India, you know, all these other countries where they're making a push toward digital textbooks because in those countries the cost of print textbooks have always been obscenely high. That, that's a question for Eric. Um, yes, and so that 270 represents almost exclusively U.S. students enrolled in formal adoption. So we had about almost 3x that number in traffic uh, of, of people coming to consume. 
um, pre-textbooks, but those are students enrolled in classes where there's been a formal adoption, and almost all of them are in the U.S. And I think we're um, uh, looking to operationalize a lot of that global activity we see, um, and we are looking first to those kinds of places that you mentioned where um, it's uh, English language uh, instruction, and primarily where they're building tremendous educational infrastructure without a lot of legacy, and, and can therefore engage in very different kinds of content relationships. Um, they're tricky, because everybody wants to sort of do that stuff on their own, and you always have that you know, uh, challenge, but, um, but we're definitely interested in having those and starting to have some of those discussions. Thank you. We just have a, a couple more minutes left. I want to conclude with a quote from the Flat World site. I think this is, you know, it's pretty interesting what they say, and this is, I think, a good word to those. They're saying, look, you're probably skeptical of our business model, and here's our response. We'll make less money per student than the big guys, but that's okay. We'll be selling to a lot more of them, and we'll be doing it for a lot less money. Like we said, this is just a smarter way to do business for all of us. And while kind of as we've discussed today, the, you know, the, the ultimate jury is still out, there are some very positive trends in the flat world model being a sustainable business model <coughs> uh, over the next books. Any other questions just in our last couple of minutes, please? Um, I have a question, and maybe Eric would be best to address this. How can you get an existing author of a textbook um, to get their textbook to be an open textbook. I don't know if that's possible if anyone's had any success. Um, so I'm proposing a new course for the school of biomedical psychology. I found a great textbook. It's not open. It's not too expensive. Um, and there's not many people that offer books on this subject. Um, how can you convince or make, has anyone had success with convincing someone to switch from the pub, their current publisher to someone like Blackboard? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think by and large the answer is you can't. Um, the most publishing agreements are uh, such that the author is transferring copyright to the publisher who now owns the copyright and they're perpetual. Um, even when they go out of print, it's not that frequent that the publisher returns the uh, copyright back to that author unless they adamantly uh, and persistently request it. Um, so generally speaking, if the, author, the publisher isn't interested in having that material become published somewhere else, they don't print. Okay, the, an easy way to check is if you go to if you go to Amazon and see if there's a Kindle version of that textbook. Right. Because if there is, then that means that somewhere in the publisher author agreement, uh -huh. they agreed on creating an e version of that textbook. Right. So if there is some kind of e version and some kind of stipulation in their contract out there. But even there, it doesn't mean. So, for example, in the places where I work, we always had the right to publish ebooks, um, and so even those ebooks that are that are Kindle versions are still publisher-owned intellectual property that they're they given Amazon the right to distribute for a percentage of the total sale. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're free to go somewhere else with that digital book. Depends on the contract language. I, I, I mean, honestly, yes, honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say flat out no. No, I agree. Because, because, because a lot of authors have republished their work. You know, even if they were published in a different edition, they could do it with a new publisher. So there's nothing that would really prevent them from making a flat world copy. It would be the flat world knowledge edition. Right. So, you know, I, I think what Eric's saying, what is true, is that oftentimes it, you will be locked into all subsequent editions or yeah, but clo it, closely related. Yeah, but it, it, it depends on the publisher and it depends right. on the on the discipline. I mean, there's a. I, I would say maybe for you know for some of the large, the really large academic publishers maybe, but there were some people who were using textbooks that are not from Springer or Elsevier or something. They're using they're using something a little more esoteric for a textbook. Um, and those publishers may have a bit more flexibility in their contract language than the bigger publishers. So this is why it's it's dangerous to say flat out no. Thank you. There's no such thing as no. Yes. So did that cost you mentioned earlier about producing the textbook involve maintenance? Um, Eric, do you want to it, it doesn't. Actually, one of the great things about having a, a sort of publishing engine that is hosted in the cloud 
is that our cost of revision is almost nothing now um, because the, there's a couple factors. So that the authors can actually go into a web platform and make updates in real time, sort of as they go, and just store it as a draft version. And 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 there's no sort of new formatting costs. There's very few new uh, costs associated with that, other than the cost of reviewing again. Uh, and even that comes way down because at that point we, we're getting lots of behavioral data from users about how they're using it, and so we have a lot more information. And so we even uh, uh, minimize the number of. Uh, 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 academic peer reviews will do on subsequent versions. We're only reviewing sort of new content in a very surgical way. So the costs of revisions are really low. Well. Thank you. Well, maybe one last question. You your hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, we have a, uh, a, fac a faculty member at our college who publishes a standard textbook. And I asked him what the markup was. Uh, he gets 15%. Uh, publisher, I don't know if that means the publisher gets 85 or perhaps the, the Seller gets part of that also, but usually the seller gets, seller gets, seller gets, gets like gets it at sixty percent. So it, like so, the bookstore, campus bookstore, usually has a it takes forty percent of the total price goes to the bookstore, and sixty percent would go to. But, but this is where the flat world story is the best. So Eric, what's the royalty yeah, so rate the for flat world? The typical relationship is a publisher sets a net price. Right. So let's say the publisher owns this book. They set a net price to the bookstore for hundred dollars. They'll pay the author fifteen percent. Of that, of that uh, hundred dollars, so fifteen. The bookstore then sets a, a retail or a list price. They mark it up thirty to thirty-five percent on top, and that's their markup. The author gets none of that. Um, and our and there's different royalty rates for different versions, right? So mobile versions are usually at a ten percent royalty rate. Uh, digital editions are at a five to ten percent royalty rate. So there's all these things. When we did it, we set a 20% royalty rate no matter where it gets sold, anywhere in the world, through any channel. Just trying to be simple about it, but also to say, over time, you actually have a chance as an author to earn more income uh, in the open model than you would in a traditional model. Well, especially if you sell more. Correct. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this is basically the path of the flower world model is, by making it available for free, will we impact the old more. We're out of time. Thanks so much. Better